Eight questions that destroy the concept of Christian rock. Okay, eight questions that you can ask somebody that's a defender of contemporary Christian music, whatever style it is. Um, this whole thing of the world's music and you take that and that style of music and you say, well, God doesn't care. God only cares about the lyrics. I can pick the style I want. I can do what I want. You know, you can be as God's. And you can listen to the secular stuff too, as long as you don't listen to the lyrics. And I, yeah, um, that whole movement, right? Here are some questions that you can ask those types of people, and it will destroy their system if they're honest, which most of them aren't. Number one, and I'm going to be showing you some scriptures here in this study now um, that prove that the whole Christian rock thing is wrong. Okay, because again, another little one, one of the little games that, that uh, CCMers make is they'll say, well, the Bible doesn't openly say that uh, contemporary Christian music is wrong or rock and roll is wrong or whatever else. Uh, and so then, then magically, because it's not specifically spelled out, now we can listen to it and we can partake in it and it's okay because God didn't you know, do it. Well, again, not a standard because God doesn't me mention methamphetamine or cocaine or heroin or, you know, whatever else, <laughs> okay? Um, but let's go over these questions. Number one, how can you speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord with rock music? Can't be done. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. One of the greatest verses in the entire New Testament on what God expects for music. Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Music has three basic parts to it. Harmony, melody, and rhythm. All three parts have to be there. But the problem is, if you put too much emphasis on rhythm, it starts to elevate the flesh. You say, well, that's just your opinion. No, actually, you can verify that thing scientifically. Okay. Okay. Um, Strip clubs don't don't uh, they don't play classical music. I'm not saying you should go to one or whatever else, but I'm saying strip clubs, bars, they don't play classical music. Look at the crowd at a a Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra. They're not out there bashing into each other and head banging and stage diving and everything else. Uh, where does that type of thing come from? Rock music, heavy metal. I've been there. Um, for a graduation present, I went to see Aerosmith and Jackal, 1994, okay? And, but I started out with the Christian rock, okay? <laughs> so, you know, how, why would you go to a secular thing? And I was a professing Christian too, by the way. So was my friend that took me. Um, and we went to a rock concert, professing Christians, listening to CCM. But it, we, we were there, you know, we were there to... To listen to the music, the style of the music, but we didn't listen to the lyrics or, you know, look at the women up front that were taking their clothes off and, and you know, smell the mar marijuana that people were smoking. I remember Steven Tyler, the lead singer of Aerosmith, literally said, I thought Hershey Park, was, or Hershey, PA, is where the concert was. He said, I, I thought Hershey was supposed to smell like chocolate. And he said, that's not chocolate that I smell. Laughing about the marijuana, all the marijuana that was being smoked there. You say, why, were in, why are you in such a wicked place? Because of Christian rock when I was a boy. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, you can study this in my, in my audio sermon that I did, The Devil and Music. But the, the body, it consists, the, you consist of three parts, body, soul, spirit. And you have, I always get the soul and the spirit thing mixed up, melody, harmony. But melody and harmony are there for the soul and the spirit. The body responds to rhythm. And again, I proved this in my study that I did. When you see rhythm, a lot of times a little baby, if they hear a, a heavy driving beat, they'll start to move their body. They don't know enough to say, well, resist that. Don't do that. Hmm. But um, one of the bands I used to listen to back when I was a young man, uh, even up into my 20s, there was a band in Australia named Mortification. And they were, uh, going to love this, Christian death metal. And the death metal style, if you're not familiar with it, they don't actually sing. They growl. <laughs> you, know, you don't even know what they're saying. Now, 
How can you listen to that music and speak that stuff to yourself? I can walk around. I've had times where I can feel spiritual problems and whatever else, and I, and I just start saying, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's power there, you see. Um, you know, once I, once I lived in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Christian death metal. <coughs> uh, yeah, well, boy, people are going to see you doing that walking through a store or whatever, and they're going to say, wow, there's a Christian. Man, that guy, I better get saved. I want to be just like him. <laughs> are you kidding me? You know, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, singing and making melody, not rhythm, melody in your heart to the Lord. How often do you sing to the Lord as praise? Can you do that with uh, your rock music, your contemporary Christian music? Can you do it? No. I actually saw a thing the one time there was a guy and, and uh, he was showing, you know, what music, what rock, per, you know, popular rock music sounds like when it's not amplified. It's pathetic. <laughs> Didn't even sound good. Get these guys. You unplug it. Clang, 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 clang. You know, doesn't even sound like anything. See, rock music, contemporary Christian music has to be amplified. It has to be electrified. It does. Show me a style that doesn't. It's all amplified. It's all, they have to, to make it loud and everything. And they'll try to go to Psalms, you know, and well, it's you just make a joyful noise, a loud noise and everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Study traditional Hebrew music. It sounds nothing at all like contemporary Christian music. Not one bit. And another thing that you'll hear too, they'll say, well, Timbrel and tabret, that's, those are types of drums. And, no, they're, they're percussion instruments. Okay, a percussion instrument, there's a large, wide variety of percussion instruments. Okay, I'll give you another example, a way that I could say this. Um, what is a wind instrument? Well, you have a whistle and you have a tuba. Well, they're the same thing. See? No, they're not. One makes a little tiny noise. A timbrel or a tabret in the Bible is like a modern tambourine. It's a little hand drum. It's not drums up there of a, of a rock music, you know, thing or whatever that's electrified and amplified and it's going out there and the, the beats and everything are controlling the crowd. It's a weak argument, very weak argument. Oh, there, the, the, there's no drums in the Bible, but timbrels and tabrets are there. So that means that drums are okay. Huh? Uh, no, no, the word drum's not in the Bible. For a reason. A timbrel and a tabret are a small handheld percussion instrument. So, can you speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord with rock music? No. With rap music? No. With heavy metal? Certainly not. No, you can't. All this stuff has to be electrified. Question number two for the modern uh, <coughs> Christian rocker. Rock and roll is derived from a street term that equals fornication. Okay. And for proof of that, we have this one here. See if I can, I think it's page 15 in this book. Yeah. Page 15, Inside Rock Music. What is rock music? Uh, rock and roll, the, terms, the term is a blues euphemism for sexual intercourse, the Rolling Stones Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll. Rock and roll is 99% sex, John Oates. Um, Oates and I can't think of the other, the band. It was a kind of a folk music, somewhat soft rock, I guess from the 1970s, if I remember correctly. Hall and Oates, I think it was. Um, everybody takes it for granted that rock and roll is synonymous with sex. Chris Stein. Rock music is sex. The big beat matches the body's rhythm. Frank Zappa. Um, 
Rock and roll, a general term with sexual implications as rocking and rolling, originally meant fornicating. It has been used to cover many styles and types of music since the early 50s. Robert Fink and Robert Ritchie, the language of 20th century music. In a sense, all rock is revolutionary. By its beat and sound, it has always implicitly re rejected restraint and celebrated freedom and sexuality. Time magazine, January 3, 1969. You cannot take sex out of rock and roll or rhythm and blues. True, the quality of the mixture spans a wide range. Kathleen Sullivan, quoted in Martha Bale's Hole in Our Soul, page 349. Right there are the quotes. Why would you defend this stuff? There you go. Okay. And there's a whole lot of other stuff in here. And um, there's scripture after scripture after scripture, by the way, too. Right here you can see page 118, just as an example, just flipped it open to this. And you have basically two-thirds of the page is covered in verses of the Bible. Right there. And look at the next chapter. Music in the Bible. All King James Version. Excellent book. We used to give these things out at our house church years and years ago. Bible Believers Fellowship. Uh, highly recommend the book. I'll be saying some more about this as, as we continue. But it, rock and roll is a, is a straight slang term for fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you go in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Wait a second here. Um, we have Christian rock. Rock and roll. Rock and roll means fornication. According to the artists themselves, the secular artists, Time Magazine, Rolling Stone, rock and roll means fornication. Now, would it make sense for me to come out and say, hey, I believe in contemporary Christian fornication. I'm a Christian fornicator. You say, well, that'd be very inappropriate. But it's okay to say Christian rock and roll. I'm a Christian rocker. No, it's sin. It's wickedness. Again, you know, it comes out, the devil brings it out and uses it to destroy a whole generation of people. Rock and roll music is disgusting. It's horrible stuff. And I used to be a very big defender of it, like I've said in other videos. Um, it's horrible. It's wicked. And people come out and they say, well, I can just make that Christian now. If you can't make fornication Christian, what makes you think you could make rock and roll Christian? That's a matter of personal preference. It's my lifestyle. It's my... It's my thing and whatever else. I don't think so. Question number three for you if you're a modern CCM, you know, I'm a Christian rock person. Number three, why did uh, Christian rock show up in the end times right before the Antichrist appears? Oh, well, you see, God waited until the end times to bring in the best form of worship music. I mean, you know, look, look at a the guy there. I mean, he's a spiritual giant there. It's a drawing of Frank Zappa, if you don't know. But, you know, this, this is spiritual here, holy, you know. I mean, we need to thank God for the, the early, you know, rock musicians like Elvis and, and then the, the Beatles and, and all these other people that openly hated God, you know. And, and Well, Elvis did a gospel album, though, so I guess he's a good guy. <laughs> Gag me. Um, but, you know... I guess, you know, Ozzy Osbourne and, and Metallica and ACDC and, and, you know, Slayer and all the early heavy metal bands, you know, and, and whatever. And now that you have the guys that are just so evil and so horrible, um, you know, just incredible. But we should thank them because they brought in that new style of music. They showed the way that the Lord used them to lead the way for the church to follow. And boy, it's, 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 made the church so strong now, you know? Boy, Christians in America, boy, they're spiritual powerhouses, aren't they? I mean, all these churches that uh, have rejected the old hymns and rejected traditional things and whatever, oh, they're, they're, they're so much stronger now with this contemporary Christian rock music. You know, literally, my oldest brother, Tom, 
Um, Tom Denlinger, he has a band. I forget what they're called. It was a um, it was originally Sardonyx was their heavy metal band, and now I can't think of what their the modern thing is. Something about rain or something. And uh, he literally said the one time, one of our family get-togethers, he said, I'm really freaked out because he said, every member of our band is on antidepressants but me. <laughs> Woo! Spiritual giants there. Yeah, I'll tell you. Number four, why do rockers grow their hair long? Get tattoos and get tattoos as a sign of rebellion against God. Oh, that's right, because, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm the Pharisee again, you know, uh -huh. down here. You know, I'm a Pharisee because I don't have tattoos. I used to have long hair, but I cut it short, you know, and everything now. And, and uh, you know, I guess I'd be a much better preacher if I would just get some body art, uh, you know, have tattoos all around my arms and things and piercings in my nose and my ears and whatever. Makes me more spiritual. Uh, no, it's showing contempt for the things of God. The Bible says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Oh, but it's okay because you can be a shame in God's sight, but God's still okay with that. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's a sin. It's wrong. You're not supposed to have long hair as a man. Well, Jesus had long hair. Prove it. Prove it from Scripture. The only you know, thing it actually says about his hair is when he gave his cheeks to the smiters to... to pluck out the hair. They ripped out his beard hair. It doesn't say one word about him having long hair. Give me a break. The Lord of glory walking around the earth and he's some long haired, hey man, you know. <laughs> you got a false God. Do you realize that? You Christian rockers out there? Wicked, wicked people. And you know, but again, who brought in the whole modern day tattoo craze? Who brought in the modern day long hair thing? The rockers. And now you get these people that profess to be Christians. They look the same. It's a problem. Question number five. Does rock music help you fight against sexual per perversion like pornography addiction or make the lust stronger? Again, I'm going to testify to that. I've said it in many different videos and things. I have different videos out there to help you with if you have pornography addiction and whatever because I was a porn addict years ago. The Lord's freed me from that now. I have victory over that sin. I hate pornography now, the stuff I used to look, you know, look at. I used to love rock music and I hate that too. But I'll tell you what, the quickest way, if you're a young man or a young woman and you struggle with pornography, the quickest way to get that lust wiped out is to start singing old hymns rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee start getting that lust get on the computer just stop what you're doing get a hymn book learn about the old hymns rock of ages um, amazing grace uh, what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of jesus it's called nothing but the blood um you know all those old hymns those beautiful old hymns and you sing those old hymns and you will feel that lust go whoop, down like that but boy, you put that uh, rock music on. I mean, you're, you're literally listening to fornication music. Okay? The, the rock and roll means fornication. You know, oh, Lord, I'm, I'm having a temptation here. Oh, boy, I just, nobody's here right now. And oh, I'm so tempted to look at some, at a porn site. Oh, Lord, help me with this thing. I know what I need to do. I'm going to put on fornication music. Well, that's brilliant. Yeah, you know, uh, hey, there, I think I smell some smoke. Well, let me just light my, my couch in my living room on fire so I can tell where the smoke's coming from. You're brilliant, you know. I, I, my house, I think, might be burning down. Let me just pour some gasoline around. That's what you're doing. You have sexual problems, some kind of perversion problems. You're looking at your, the temptation to, for pornography. Stop listening to rock music, rap music, heavy metal, any of that stuff. Wake up. Number six, when uh, <clears throat> Christian fornicate, I mean, uh, rockers play secular music and change the lyrics, does this discourage lost people from listening to or thinking about the music, the original music lyrics? Okay, you can watch the uh, wicked full gospel assembly that I went and rebuked. My wife and I rebuked them, 
and I read the scriptures and things. We were rebuking them out there. They were taking songs. They had uh, they took ACDC's one song, um, TNT. You know, I'd hear that thing. I'd listen to it. You know, when I was a teenager, in my in late teens, early twenties, I remember there was a, a a restaurant, Timberline Lodge. The thing was bulldozed since then, but you know, I used to be a dishwasher there. And you go in there, and they had uh, um, I forget what the radio station was now, but they 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 was classic rock, you know, and, and things. And I remember TNT, I'm dynamite, you know, and they'd sing this, you know, ACDC song. And these wicked Satanists over at this Bridgewater Full Gospel Assembly cult satanic hell building, these wicked Satanists took it and they took TNT and they said Jesus Christ, and da da da, and you can hear the song. In the on the secondary channel, you can watch the video, and you watch that thing. And if you have a history in classic rock, the words to ACDC song will come into your head and play right over top of their uh, Christian lyrics. You know they will. I mean, we were standing there in the, you know in our office at at Bridgewater, the house where we lived for five years. And I was getting ready to do a sermon outline, and I, I, I looked outside, and I saw all these vehicles pulling in, you know, and they were setting up this stage, and I thought, what's this all about? Uh, whatever, I got work to do, and I'm, you know, working for the Lord here, and I, you know, I'm starting to write to get, you know, write a sermon, and all of a sudden, blaring out loud, massively loud, they took the, the, the song, um, you know, There Is a House in New Orleans, they call The Rising Sun, it's about the brothel down there and whatever, and they, they took that song and they put Christian lyrics to it and blaring it out loud. And I walked right over. It was just the Holy Spirit just almost shoved me out the door. And I walked right over and I got in the guy's face and I said, what are you doing? I said, this is wicked. And they started laughing at me and I said, fools make a mock of sin. And I yelled at them and I rebuked them in the name of the Lord and I walked off. They haven't had the thing yet since then. They called the police on me. I called the police a couple times. Police wouldn't come out. And then they called the police on me. And they said, you know, we have a permit. They lied. You know, the whole thing. You can watch the video. But it, it just, it was disgusting. Now, I guess according to some, I was a Pharisee because I went over and rebuked them. No, you see, I went and rebuked them because the Holy Spirit of God has showed me over the years what rock music really is all about. That it's satanic. It's a horrible, disgusting, filthy thing. And to think of taking something vile and wicked and saying, we're going to just kind of remold it and say, here, it's about Jesus. We're going to take a song about a brothel. What's rock and roll music again? Fornication? We're going to take a song about a brothel and praise the Lord with it. <sighs> yeah. And these people do this all the time. They do it a lot. I remember uh, seeing a video years ago where Rick Warren, that satanic devil, who, by the way, in his 40 Days of Purpose, teaches this exact thing right here. God has no personal preference. You can be as God. Oh, I mean, uh, do what thou wilt. No. Um, you can pick your music. That's what it was. And uh, God has no personal preference about music. It's up to you. You can worship the Lord however you want. And this wicked Satanist, Rick Warren, years ago, he came out and he was at some big youth conference or some big conference or whatever, and he came out singing Jimi Hendrix, Hendrix's song, uh, Purple Haze, All Through My Mind, singing about devil spirits and, and drug-induced altered states of consciousness. And Rick, Rick Warren comes out, Purple Haze, you know, he's singing the whole song. But that's okay. That's okay. Because, see, the satanic philosophy is God only cares about the lyrics. So you can take songs that are satanic, openly singing about the devil and worshiping the devil. And you can say, well, we'll just kind of remold it and repackage it for Jesus. <laughs> no, you can't. Give you another verse of scripture here. I mean, you know, this, this thing called Christianity is so vile and so wicked and so disgusting. I can understand why it ends with the Lord saying to the church of Laodiceans, you know, you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. I will spew thee out of my mouth. You know, and I do believe that there's some, you know, instruction in righteousness there. And uh, it lines up with how the church age ends. And you can compare it to other scriptures. The time will come when they will not endorse sound doctrine. All the other things. They'll, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. 
itching ears, you know, that uh, like certain types of music. I just like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, you can see how the Lord is disgusted and sickened by this. I mean, you know, and I mean, there's, there's Christian pole dancing, Christian tattoos, Christian, all kinds of wicked stuff out there. And all these people are saying, well, we're doing it for you, God. No, you're doing it for yourself. Rock music is for you if you listen to it. God doesn't want it. But I guess, you know, hey, the sky's the limit. You can read the Bible and say, hey, it doesn't, you know, doesn't say anything about robbing a, um, an ATM. <laughs> you know, um, it doesn't say anything about me shooting somebody in the head. So technically, I guess I can. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I guess the Bible doesn't openly have the word pedophilia or pedophile. So therefore, it must be okay. People are insane. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Is rock music holy? No. Number two, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You, not one rocker out there, CCMer, not one of you can say that you're not conformed to the world. Not one of you. Again, I lived that way for all those years. I was there, okay? None of you little young guys out there, I'm going to be 45 years old this year, okay? You're in your 20s, you just need to sit down and shut up. And I say that with all Christian charity. Shut your stupid mouth. You don't know what you're talking about. I was there when the old churches were out there and they had all the old hymns and everything else. Contemporary services weren't even thought of when I was a boy. And I remember the first Sunday, a young guy stood up. I can't think of his first name. Last name was Laycock. And he stood up and he had an earring in his ear. And he sang an old hymn. And the people freaked out about it. And they said, how dare you allow this young man to stand up with an earring and sing special music on Sunday morning. And a little while later, one of the bigger families uh, in there, they had a, 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 I can't think of the names right now, it's many, many years ago, but they had this, there was a, uh, the daughter of one of the big families, she had married a guy and he had long hair. She was in love with this CCM guy, uh, Mylon Lefevre, Lefevre, um, uh, I can't think of the name of the rest of his band, but he had this band and this woman, she idolized this man. And so she wanted her husband to look like him. And they stood up and they did this kind of a CCM type of song. And again, the people fought it and they said, this is wrong. This is terrible. What are you doing? This has no place in a church. And that same church today has a contemporary worship service. I wouldn't go in there if, if my life depended on it. If my vehicle broke down was was out along the road and I had to walk 10 miles, I'd walk 10 miles rather than going into that satanic building. Disgusting. What happened? They conformed to the world. That's what they did. So you oh young people, well well brother Brian, you haven't considered some points that I've that I've looked into and things. Oh, honey child. <laughs> honey child. And I say this cuz it just angers me. I mean I, don't, I haven't preached much against the whole Christian rock music because it's just kind of a no-brainer. You look at the thing, you just say, okay, yeah, that stuff's evil. Look what it does. It exalts the flesh. It just, it's wicked. And I can say that as a former defender of it. But, you know, I'm going to bring out some stuff on it. Um, question number seven for you if you're into the whole contemporary Christian music thing. Where does the Bible say that music style is a personal preference? Point number two, the style of music is a matter of personal preference. Okay, chapter and verse. Give me a chapter and verse. Give me one verse of scripture from the King James Bible that says it's up to you to decide what kind of music you want to listen to. See, I, you can argue and say my music isn't specifically condemned, but I can turn that argument right back on you and say, okay, but where does the Bible say that you can decide what type of music to listen to? Where does the Bible say it? And of course, you know, the, the young, you know, little child, immature child will say, 
yes, but there are certain styles of music that uh, people like you listen to, like bluegrass. And well, that's not, you know, that wasn't come up with by the church. Oh, no, it's actually a, a kindred music. Okay. It's a tradi traditional uh, music of Northern European people is what bluegrass comes from, by the way. And I don't endorse all types of bluegrass either. I might add that. You say, what about symphony orchestra? Again, stringed instruments, wind instruments, percussion instruments, harmony, melody, primary emphasis, and rhythm to help the music score along. Uh, again, study the waltz beat. All right, there's a lot of studies out there. Ruckman did a really big study on the whole thing of music um, and proved conclusively that rock music is wicked. It's satanic. But the Bible gives us three things where we can agree to disagree on. Number one, esteeming one day above another. That certainly is there. Number two, eating meat or herbs. You can be a vegetarian as a, as a Bible-believing, saved individual. You say, I ah, don't really, you know, especially now with all the thing of the baloney virus and you can't, you know, they, they shut down the meat processing plants and you get, can't get meat in the stores or whatever. Well, you might have to become a vegetarian. <laughs> um, but, you know, whatever. Somebody wants to eat herbs, they have some health issues or whatever, okay, fine, N not a problem. We can agree to disagree on that. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not a vegan. Okay. Uh, number three, women's physical head covering. Again, you read about that in 1 Corinthians 11. It talks about, you know, we have no such custom. If any man seem to be contentious, you know, we have no such custom. Neither the churches of God. Uh, let's go to the verse there. Let me just show you that verse. Um, because this is an important thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14, we'll go there. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory for her, or to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay, notice the distinction. God loves distinction. God has preferences. God's not up here like the CCMers teach and say, God only cares about the lyrics. The style of music is up to you. God doesn't care. That is a lie. It's a total lie. God wants distinction. God wants men to have short hair. If you can grow a beard, I would say to do that. I'm not going to call you a sinner if you don't grow a beard. Whatever. But you need to look like a man and act like a man if God made you a man. And if you're a woman, then look and act like a lady with long hair. Distinction. God wants distinction. Look at verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. And you look at the whole context of chapter 11, verses 1 down through verse 13. It's talking about physical head covering versus spiritual head covering. All right. Don't let anybody tell you, well, it, you know, the, the, the contentious thing there is about a man having long hair. You're ignoring the entire context of that passage. It's about physical head covering. Again, what do you have in the first century? The vast majority of saved brethren back then were Jews. Look into Orthodox Judaism. The women wear head coverings, a physical head covering. All right? The Gentiles weren't. So there's contention there in the church, and they're saying, hey, I'm, I'm a Jewish, you know, saved individual. Uh, our women wear head coverings. And over here is a Gentile saved woman. She doesn't have a head covering on. Where's your distinctive Christian veil? <laughs> And Paul's saying, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Woman wants to have a, a physical head covering, fine. Her spiritual head covering is her husband. But if she wants to wear something on her head, that's fine, whatever. Paul's not saying, hey, you know, it's a shame for a man to have long hair, but eh, make up your mind yourself. Eh, it's fine. Oh, uh, that's a lie. That's not what Paul was saying at all. I mean, I mean, just think, think here. Again, so many people come in when they hear these little arguments and whatever else, and you just sit just Wait a second. Let me just think about this for a minute. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair, but God doesn't care. How does that work? Uh, no. If the Lord says, hey, I'm, I'm ashamed of you if you do something, that means he doesn't want you to do that. So, uh, again, but to go, to go back to the original question here, question number seven, where does the Bible say that music style is a matter of personal preference. The Bible doesn't openly condemn Christian rock. Okay, then where does the Bible say, let's argue in reverse, where does the Bible say that it's up to you to decide the kind of music that you want to listen to? 
I mean, the God of, of heaven and earth, the Lord of glory. And he just kind of says, meh, whatever. I don't care about music. Um, do you really know God? You have to question that. And finally, uh, number eight, question number eight, where does the Bible say that music should be used to witness to the lost? And that's a very, very important question right there. Because you see, that's the whole reason that this thing got started. CCM, you go back to all the original people, they were all saying, we need to be like the lost to win the lost. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. You know, this whole thing. That was the original uh, justification for this type of music. Again, going back into the 1980s when I was a boy. And a lot of the whole Christian rock, Christian contemporary stuff was, was coming out and uh, Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant and, you know, all these other people and, and, and stuff. And it was all, you know, but, but if we want to reach the youth, we have, to, we have to have music that appeals to them. And, you know, the old rugged cross might not appeal to them and, and whatever. See, 20th century Christianity, if you can really sum it up, is basically the entire 20th century was about marketing Christianity to the lost world. Okay? You have the big revivals of the late 1800s going into the early 1900s, and they started to say, we need to get more people in. Let's get more people in. Let's get these numbers up. Let's go and preach at Madison Square Garden. Let's go and preach at this big stadium. Let's go and preach here, and let's go and preach there. And you look at a guy like Billy Sunday, and he's up there preaching the word, you know, and he's up there, and the Bible says, and, he, and like some kind of a circus guy. What's he doing? He's putting on a show. He would run back and forth. He'd stand up on the pulpit and he'd, he'd wave the flag, you know, and get people going into the war and all this other stuff. Yeah, I mean, look it up. Good buddy with uh, John D. Rockefeller. Little problem there. But see, they made all these big revivals and everything else and they got all the people all riled up and, and things and then, oh, let's, let's build a church. Let's build these big church buildings. And the big church buildings, they built them in a way that they were lovely and beautiful and wow, look how big that thing is. Why? To get lost people to come there. And all of a sudden they start putting on Christmas cantatas and Easter cantatas and, and we're going to have revival meetings and we bring, you know, how many people here uh, tonight brought, um, you know, new people to the service. And you can see Peter Ruckman doing that in some of his sermons. Um, new visitors tonight, how many? How many did you bring, brother? Six new visitors? Anybody have bring, bring more than six? Okay, then he'll get the drawing tonight. What? Jack Hiles puts on campaigns. Come here and you get a free McDonald's sandwich. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. You know, I stand with Hiles coffee cups and you, and you put it up and there's Jack Hiles' picture on the bottom. Again, I'm not joking. <laughs> you know, all of these things. Let's do school bus ministry where we'll go out and we'll pick up people's children that, that want to get rid of them for Sunday morning and, and we'll get them into the church and, and we'll bring them in and bring them in and bring them in. Not one verse of Scripture Nowhere does the Bible say that the church should be lost people and saved people worshiping together. In fact, let me show you a verse on that. Because see, again, the, the, the foundation for Christian rock, for CCM, is all about evangelizing the lost. That was the foundation. And now because people are so brain dead, after all these years later, they forget what it was all about originally. And now it's, well, this is our style of worship. We're worshiping God and whatever. Now it's, they're trying to make it into worship. But you go back to the very first early Christian rock artist. Uh, Keith Green was another one. Died in a plane crash. Praise the Lord. The guy was wicked. And this guy, these people would come out and they were saying, we got to reach the lost with, with the, this music. The music that they can relate to. Let's get to the unchurched by building church buildings that would, you know, that they're going to be wowed by and everything else. That was the movement of the 20th century. But let me show you the scripture here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye, plural. See, people, though, the, the church building people, they'll say, this is about marriage. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Um, well, how does that work if it's talking about ye are the temple of the living God? It's talking about worshiping God. Keep reading. 
For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, plural, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. It's about church buildings. Every church building out there is open to the saved and the lost. You know that as a fact. Again, another proof that church buildings are wicked and wrong. I mean, if you haven't been convinced with all the shut down the church and they say, yes, sir, yes, sir, we'll shut it down. There's not much help for you right now, I realize. But, uh, you know, another big argument against the whole church building thing. Everyone's welcome. The church with a heart. We're here to serve you. We're here to make you comfortable. Is this your first time here? Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today for the first time and you've, you've never, you don't know for sure you're going to go to heaven when you die, would you please repeat this prayer? Come forward now and pledge your 10% tithe to the church so we can keep this work going. <laughs> yeah, and contemporary Christian music has a big part in that. That was its whole reason for its foundation. 20th century is when the body of Christ went down the toilet. Because that's when you had people that were believers started to say, hey, you know what? Let's go to these big massive revivals and let's invite the lost. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say, go ye into all the world and invite the lost into your church so that you can witness to them. No, it's go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. You go out there and you get people saved and then you bring them in and teach them. You don't go out and say, hey, come on into the church so we can leaven the church with you lost people. Hey, let's, let's, let's go on out and get a bunch of lost people and make the church comfortable for them. What happened with the new versions and the King James Bible? You go back to 1901, the American Standard Version came out. Why? Well, we just need to revise a few things in here because after all, the King James Bible is awfully hard to understand. It's got all those these and thous and beholdeth and everything else in it. And, and it's, just, it's just too hard to understand. And, and we just need to rewrite it. Why? Well, we have people in church that don't understand it. Oh, you mean lost people. Lost people don't understand this book. They're not supposed to. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto them. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Oh, but, but, you know, we have to be able to have Bibles that appeal to the lost. We have to have music that appeals to the lost. And we can prefer which Bible version we want, which one speaks to me the best, and I can prefer the kind of music that I like. I, I can prefer whatever I want, you see? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you can be as God's. Well, I don't like the Methodist church down the road because I, the color of their carpet kind of clashes with the, the padded seats, you know, the pews. And I, I, I actually kind of prefer the, the, the full gospel assembly over there because they actually don't even have pews. They have chairs, and it's a lot more comfortable. And, you know, I, I kind of prefer that. And their coffee is much better than the Baptist church down the road. And You can be as gods. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole law. Aleister Crowley. You see? And by the way, if you study this right here, this book, they actually talk about, there was a man that talked to a, a, one of the leaders, a, like a big record company guy, um, back years and years ago, and he said there's a fourfold plan with rock music. This big record music, you know, kind of guy. And he said the whole thing is we as rock musicians, promote, the industry people promoting this, we want to bring rock music into the churches because people will spend whatever money they have to if they believe it's a way to worship their God. And by merging rock music and religion together as contemporary Christian music, we can control people. Yeah. You see, that what's, that's what the real agenda is all about. That's what the whole thing is about. And see, the devil is very intelligent. The devil is very, very wise. Um, he knows how to get people. And he can get you if you're a Bible believer. Because, you know, one of the best things that we say as Bible believers is chapter and verse. Where's this stuff at in Scripture? And the devil understands that. 
He's very, very smart. And he can come along and he can say, the Bible doesn't openly condemn this. It's not in there. So it's up to you. God doesn't care. Hey, if you like a little bit of rock music now and then, okay. If you want to listen to some little heavier stuff, your grandparents might, might not like it, but uh, you know, they lean a little bit this way, you know, Pharisee, a little bit Pharisaical, but, but just, you know, respect the older people. They just don't, they're not as wise as you. You're, you're closer to the Lord because you have that new style of music that's come out and, and oh, look at, look at the power that it has. And think of how many people you can witness to with your new music. Yeah. There's another, or another book here. I was going to show this one. Keep going here. Um, I don't even think it's in print anymore. Chick Publications used to put this thing out by Jeff Godwin. And uh, he wrote two other books. But What's Wrong with Christian Rock? But I thought it was a very, rather appropriate picture there. You know, the, a female musician with jeans on, you know, dancing wildly, inappropriately on top of a pulpit. You get rid of the Bible, Bible teaching and preaching. You go to some service somewhere, you might get 10 minutes of this. And what do you get the rest of the time in that? Used to be you'd go past a bar and you'd hear the boom, 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 the driving beat, the heavy rhythm, the rhythm that's faster than your natural heart rate so that it gets your adrenaline up used in war for many centuries, used by heathen and pagan people, used by voodoo practitioners so that a spirit can mount you. Uh, yeah, devil possession, in other words. Used to be the bars that you'd hear that. Now you get past the churches. Mm -hmm. And look at the kind of quality of people that they're producing. Rotten, filthy, vile, false converts don't know Jesus Christ and you try to talk to them about Jesus Christ and they'll say, that's not my Jesus. My Jesus would never do that. My Jesus would never say that. My Jesus, he, he's, he's a rock and roll guy. Yeah, and, and uh, your Jesus is going to show up. It's called the Antichrist. I'm sure they're going to have some real great rock parties and whatever else. I'm sure the news media is going to have rock and roll and everything else that they can control you with. Sure, Absolutely. So, those are the questions. Go over them one more time. Number one, how can you speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord with rock music? You can't. You can't. You just, you, you, how can you sing the lyrics to rock music songs? And you, you look at these, these lyrics to these rock music songs. They're so pathetic. They're so anemic. You don't even know what they're singing about half the time. Why? Well, the, the Christian rockers are trying to, you know, maybe sell a few records to the lost too out there because of the big money that's involved. Question number two, rock and roll is derived from a street term that equals fornication. Can you have Christian fornication? Matter of scientific proof. It's not open for debate. That's not my opinion. Rock music means fornication, but you can Christianize it. Question number three, why did Christian rock show up in the end times right before the Antichrist appears. There's a falling away in the end times, not a getting better. Number four, why do rockers grow their hair long and get tattoos as a sign of rebellion against God? Some don't. I understand it. You know, there's certain ones that don't. Yeah. But they are in the same bands as the ones that do. Why do they do that? And by the way, you go back to the 1980s with all the glamour rock guys like at Striper and some of these other you know guys and uh, can't think of some of the other bands back then the <clears throat> Christian bands they look like transvestites. Number five, why does or, or, excuse me does rock music help you fight against sexual perversion like pornography or make the lust get stronger? Stronger. Try it. You know, well, brother, brother, can you give me a chapter and verse that says that rock music is 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 there and makes you know your your desire to look at pornography worse? Can you can you show me where the Bible actually says those exact words? Can you show it to me? Because if it can't show it to me, then I'm not going to be able to believe it. <laughs> um, 
God is a God of science. Okay? The Bible warns about opposition of science falsely so called, like evolution and a lot of the other filthy garbage, stupid idiot nonsense. I love these words. I love to use them. But uh, the Bible can be scientifically verified and scientifically proven. So if you're a young person and you fall for pornography, um, next time you start to get that lust, that, that desire, start singing some old hymns. See how it goes. I speak from experience. Question number six. When Christian rockers play secular music and change the lyrics, does this discourage lost people from listening to or thinking about the original music lyrics? See some lost person walking around after a concert and this uh, Christian band just played this secular music and changed the lyrics to it. Say, could you sing that song for me? They'll sing the secular song. They aren't going to remember the, the Christian lyrics. Of course not. Question number seven, where does the Bible say that music style is a personal preference? I'll throw it right back at you. Does the Bible openly condemn rock music by name? No, it doesn't doesn't say rock music thou shalt not listen to rock music or something like this thou shalt not listen to um you know pop and rap and heavy metal and death metal um you know and list it out it doesn't say that but i can use it against you and say okay then where does the bible say it's a matter of your personal preference show it to me and question number eight where does the bible say that music should be used to witness to the lost nowhere Nowhere at all. And that's the very foundation of the whole Christian contemporary music movement. So if you're listening to that stuff, you are in sin. You are wicked. And again, like I said, I speak from experience. I wasn't right with God when I was listening to that stuff and, and defending it and everything else. So that's going to be it. I do pray that you study this issue. If you are listening to rock music, I pray that you repent. So that is going to be it, and we'll see you in the next video. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.